Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Talking Feds one-on-one. It's been a roiled and tumultuous couple months on college campuses with demonstrations turning into encampments, turning into accusations uh, of um, violence and disruption of the university function. Um, And a lot of people have been trying to get their heads around the right approaches here, including uh, campus administrations that have shown very uh, different and some successful and some more de- unsuccessful even debacles uh, across the country. Uh, no one better to discuss this than David French, a uh, the New York Times columnist, frequent talking feds uh, guest, but and also the previous uh, president of the um, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, which concerns itself in particular with this whole stew of uh, free speech and uh, and p- potential um, civil disobedience and the like on campus. So um, he's also recently authored uh, a, a number of pieces, but the one that really caught my eye and I recommend to everyone as a kind of um, introduction piece is colleges have gone off the deep end, but there is a way out. So um, David French, thank you very much for being here. Thanks so much, Harry. It's always a pleasure to join you. So let's start with a statement from your op-ed, David. You talk, you say there's a profound confusion uh, these days around the distinctions among free speech, uh, civil disobedience, and lawlessness. Uh, can you elaborate? And in particular, you ground your story in your own experience in 1991. I think the presence of 1968 in particular hovers around sometimes in a romantic and distorted way, all of these things. But to the extent you think this confusion is new, uh, can you uh, give us a sense of why are these demonstrations different from all other demonstrations? Well, there's some differences and some similarities. There's, uh, there's a, there are consistent themes in college demonstrations going all the way back to the 60s. And in, and in 1991 is my first encounter with college demonstrations. And I use that in the piece to, to note that my first encounter with college demonstrations helped launch my career as a free speech attorney. And so in the 33 years since that 1991 moment, I have uh, defended countless protesters. I've seen countless university protests. I've been protested at universities. And so we're looking at a lot of this and trying to sort our way through it as if we don't have all of that history. But we do have all of that history, and that history informs this moment. And and the way I parsed it is I said there's basically three buckets here. There's the free speech bucket which is essentially that all public universities are obligated and then uh, by law and private universities should, by policy, um, protect the full range of First Amendment rights of students. And that means protecting rights uh, to protest on a viewpoint neutral basis, on a content neutral basis, treating all students the same when it comes to their access to university facilities, being broadly permissive of peaceful protest in the public spaces of campus, In other words, a a campus, a student should not lack for opportunities to express their point of view on campus. And the whole time, they should be protected from discrimination on the basis of their viewpoint and their content uh, from interference or censorship by the university. And that, that standard right there encompasses the vast majority of protest activities on college campuses. But then we get to sometimes get to bucket number two, which is civil disobedience. And this is what a lot of people say the current, a lot of the current protests are. They're not so much free speech, which is lawful, but they're civil disobedience where they're breaking the law to make a point. But peaceful civil disobedience most beautifully, like the the entire concept was most beautifully articulated by Martin Luther King. And the whole concept of, of peaceful civil disobedience is that highlights an unjust law by breaking it, but honors the rule of law by accepting the consequences. So the formula for peaceful civil disobedience is there's an unjust law that you break, but then you accept the consequences of your violation. But that's not what's happening on campus. 
<laughs> and let me actually stop you. We're going yeah. to go on to lawlessness, but I think this sure. is an interesting concept because you think of, I, I just read the uh, a, a piece by the Wesleyan University uh, a president who's basically saying, yeah, they're violating our rules, but they think there's some educational mission here. And the students themselves, I think, well, so what of this argument? You would find some of the demonstrators saying, that's a nice concept, French, but there are other, um, uh, you know, dissent traditions where, um, you know, you think of, I don't know, the guy with his feet up on the desk in the Columbia University president's uh, office. We, we don't want to be so polite. We want to change the world. And so our, our civil disobedience is it isn't aimed at just, you know, a peaceful protest against the, the uh, an unjust law, um, but but rather, you know, it's part of our. This is a way to put maybe what the what uh, I hope this isn't too distorting of what the Wesleyan president is saying. You know, we're in college. It's kind of part of our educational mission to make trouble and uh, you know really uh, rattle the trees. And it's not so. Polite. We won't get. We'll get to lawlessness in a moment. But what of the the notion that uh, you know we we want a ruckus because it's uh, shines a harsher light on what we're trying to change. Well, then that gets into things like rebellion. So, for example, civil disobedience because you comply with the consequences uh, hold, upholds the rule of law. This is the king argument. If you say. I want to break the law and I don't want to experience the consequences of law because I believe my cause is so just that I'm going to break things, then that's rebellion. So there is a history of rebellion in the United okay. States of America. And it's fine, but it's rebellion. I'll, I'll keep I'll, I'll keep being the agitator here. Right. You know, let's talk about the encampments, but again, put to the side some of the the um a the really indefensible assaults on other students. But I'm also thinking of Israel a few years ago and the kind of tent cities along Goldschmidt Avenue. I'm, uh, people have tried to do this across from the White House. I'm just saying there is this, um, what is, besides that it's rebellion or it's uh, you know, not classic MLK civil disobedience. We're on college campus. You know, there's a feel sometimes from the administration. You know, it's part of your. You, you take intramural sports. You take a physics I class, mean, and by gum, you know, go ahead and and uh, and and really agitate. Is that what is the specific problem with that? Before we get into the rights of other students, well. That's like saying, what's the problem with the play, Mrs. Lincoln, Is that okay? other than the assassination? I mean, because when you're talking about the ruckus, if it's just a ruckus, nobody cares. I mean, if it's I'm being loud, um, I'm, you know, most of these college campuses, they say, you know, in these big open spaces, you can have them from such a time till such a time. And you know, go off, you know, say your piece, sing your songs, chant your chants, bang your drums. And I would protect all of that. All of that is protected. But what they're not, that's not what they're wanting to do. Well, that's true. To, okay. So maybe yeah. we, but I, I was just thinking, you know, if these were true, work staying longer than you're in camp. I mean, there's, there's a way in which students specifically want to break the rules, whatever they might be, if they were in a place in campus where they weren't disrupting others, you know, uh, progress um, and, and going back and forth. But I, I think it's fair to say this is not representative of what's happening, so it doesn't get to right. the confusion you're talking about. All right, so you've, you, we've got a third category that I've um, a very, very irascibly and obstreperously prevented you from getting to. What's your third category? Well, just to go back to your your point, the University of Chicago actually tried that for a bit. They said, okay, even though the encampments don't do violate our policies, even though the encampments, we don't allow overnight camping for a million great reasons on campus, we're going to let you do it so long as you don't disrupt. So it was kind of like, yeah, attaboy, have your college experience. Yes. And we can't have nice things. So the the demonstrators went ahead and disrupted the educational experience anyway. And so- what what happens this is chicago where my boy is and 
the ha- the home of Calvin principles and seen as yeah. the so even they bent a little here. Yeah, they bent a little, and they said we're going to give you a little extra room. And then the students took all the room that ca- Chicago gave them and went beyond that. So what when you're talking about lawlessness is what we've seen at many of these campuses, but not all, but not all, certainly is. You're going to violate just laws. In other words, these laws that say there's time, place, and manner restrictions around, say, use of the quad, et cetera, they're extremely just. Why are they just? Because if I take it upon myself to build a tent city on a college campus quad, you know who else can use that quad? Nobody. I'm taking it. I'm saying it's mine. And you're going to actually violate, if the university allows that to happen, they're going to violate. And if it's a public university, they're going to violate the First Amendment rights of other students because they have equal access to that yard, to that lawn. And so it's not a harmless, no harm, no foul to say, we're just going to let this happen because you're excluding other people. So for example, there at campus, there was a Hillel chapter who had reserved part of the quad for Holocaust ceremonies and Holocaust Remembrance Day. Can't do it. Can't do it because the protesters have decided they get to run the quad. That's Law, that's that's not just lawless. It's actually violating the rights of others. Similarly, a lot of these protests, a lot of these vile chants and, and actions to prohibit the free movement of Jewish students, that be- starts to tip over. If it's severe enough, pervasive enough, it starts to tip over into actual harassment that is forbidden by federal law. So what we're talking about here isn't sort of harmless hey, we're just going to be on this part of campus, break the rules a little bit, but not really interfere with the rights of others. No, what's happening is these camp encampments, both by their conduct and their existence, are violating the rights of other students. And I'm sorry, but one small group of students does not get to say, my cause is so just that your right to learn in peace, to study in peace, and if you're a Jewish student, to attend college in peace, is secondary to my right to disrupt all of that. The law prohibits that as an option. If universities allow it to continue, if you have a university president who is ridiculously dumb enough to sort of say, like, this level of disruption is part of the educational experience, well, they're going to get sued and they're going to cost their institution a giant amount of money and they may face federal court injunctions. And so... You know, this is not a situation where you can say, well, we got to let these college kids be college kids. Okay, yeah, that's why you do allow broad range of protests, but you don't say part of college kids being college kids is they get to violate the rights of other students. That's not the case. All right, so much to unpack here. Let's start with the small group of students because it does, I don't know if this matters exactly, but it does seem like the eyewitness accounts of people who have gone in first uh, make it seem as if the the protesters are less robust in numbers than portrayed. And there's a kind of, uh, you know, maybe twas ever thus, including in the sainted uh, demonstrations of the 60s, but a kind of a party uh, atmosphere and a sort of other side of the college experience. I I know in one place there have been demands for, you know, not just food, but condoms and and the like. So that's part of it. And relatedly, there's a sense that I think it's hard to get our hands around that there's a kind of cadre of professional demonstrators, sort of non, who have come in and kind of organized and have a sort of playbook. Does... um, do you have any sense of whether that's the case, and should it matter if it is? Well, these demonstrations, it's what's interesting about a lot of the reporting is you spend any time a student demonstration, you know it's not one thing. So you can walk around for much of the day, and especially if the student demonstrators like you or see you as sympathetic to them, you're going to see this really warm experience. You're going to see the teach-ins. You're going to see the drum circles. You're going to see all of this. But if you're somebody that the demonstrators are hostile towards, you're going to see the anger and you're going to see the exclusion and you're going to see the acts of intimidation. And so two people can have very different experiences with the same group of people. 
And so it's very difficult often. And then sometimes you'll have a demonstration. Let's say there's 100, 200 students there. And five of them or 10 of them are just grossly anti-Semitic in their chanting and their speeches. Now, of course, the other 195 or whatever students, they're not guilty of that. But the college is responsible for the environment that the students are encountering, Jewish students are encountering in college. And if they're allowing an encampment in which there is a persistent presence, even minority presence, of overt and harassing anti-Semitism, the college has a problem on its hands here. And so uh, a lot of the reporting, people will go and they'll see one part of the whole and they'll say, wow, that's cool. That's Look at all the singing and chanting and dancing and warmth and, and you know, and college students being college students. And then another group of people will say, I couldn't even make my way to class. Uh, I was chased and hounded because I had a Star of David necklace. I had to hide under my desk. This is some of the testimony you have in, at Harvard, for example, of, of Jewish students hiding under their desks, literally. And so in that circumstance, the fact that the protest is, quote unquote, mostly peaceful or mostly not anti-Semitic as a legal matter becomes irrelevant if it is persistently anti-Semitic and persistently rule-breaking in a way that it inflicts particular harm on Jewish students. It, you know, Jonah keep... Goldberg has a really nice piece in the LA Times that basically points out that there we think of these protests as being the very soul of the First Amendment, but he, he you know, he cites enlightenment principles and thinks of the, the individual conscience as being the most important and, and, they, and this kind of large-scale expression can sort of lap over into populism, but it really is the individual speaker who, who deserves protection. Um, let me stick with this for just a moment and the problem of, of uh, Jewish students. So um, everything you said, I think, nobody would defend, although it's a separate question whether they would robustly respond. But what about, um, you know, just a kind of anxiety? There's a special problem here. Well, first, there's a whole problem that is different from the 60s in that you have students pitted against students. But uh, the there's a sense in which the um, robust but um, but just expressive protest about the war in Gaza kind of bristles or has in the periphery a, a feel of anti-Semitism. Is, is there, I assume it's a very hard line to draw, David, but I'm just asking, cowering under desk, certainly no good. Uh, uh, but at what, at what point does, the, does a Jewish student need to be told, um, you know, part of the rough and tumble of free speech in a university or the world to the extent you feel a little nervous, suck it up. Or in fact, you know, to the extent you feel a little nervous, we would, it, it seems like other groups would be protected. Maybe we, we uh, come in. What, how, how thin or thick do other, and here I guess we're talking inevitably about Jewish students, students skins need to, to be. And it's, problem both for the administration and for the law. Yeah. So the answer is actually pretty easy to state. You are not protected from ideas under the law. You are protected from harassment and ideas are not harassment. <laughs> okay. Globalize so, the infatata as you're walking across campus. No protection. That's, that's Globalize the intifada is protected. That's protected speech. Yeah. I mean, no protection yeah. for the Jewish student who right. is like scared. That's an idea. It, yeah, globalize the intifada from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. Conversely, a Jewish student could yell carpet bomb Gaza. That's protected. So you're not protected from even calls for violence unless a call for violence is, is uh, calculated to imminent lawless action and is likely to lead to imminent lawless action. At the same time, however, if universities say, well, you know, Jewish students you have to absorb all kinds of, of, of negative speech, but no other community does. So this is, a, this is a, a world in which a part of this is kind of almost laughable in the way that the universities are saying they're guardians of free speech right now when they've been spending the last two decades talking about things like microaggressions for other campus communities. And so it cannot, the rule cannot be 
that we protect every campus community from the rigors of free speech, except Jewish students. And Jewish students and Jewish students alone have to suck it up. That is not the way the law works, right? And so bottom line is you're not protected from ideas, even ideas that are painful to hear. You are protected from harassment. And what is harassment? Harassment is much more, and a lot of free speech lawyers, their their teeth will get a little set on edge when I say this, but but a, a good way for a lay person to think through harassment is it's not about the content or the viewpoint of the speech. It's much more about where and how, the time, place, and manner of how the speech takes place or the conduct. So for example, I can chant the, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free in a free speech public forum all day long, and that's fine. If I find a Jewish student in class and I start chanting that at them in class, that is disrupting their ability to receive an education. That's targeting because specific individual targeting because of their Jewish ancestry. If I am pounding on doors, as some of the evidence shows in some of these cases, whether you know Jewish students or Israeli students are behind the door, even if I'm shouting a constitutionally protected slogan at that time, the aggressive physical pounding on the doors and the attempt to take over physically again become moves into harassment. Harassment is such is well, yeah, what is harassment? Conduct. It's conduct that's so severe and pervasive that is based, it's unwelcome conduct that is so severe or pervasive, targeting you on the basis of race, color, and national origin. Uh, to such an extent that it deprives you of the ability to receive the benefit of the educational program. In other words, so if a Jewish student is receiving um, treatment that makes him have a different and worse educational experience on the basis of every uh, compared to everyone else on campus, if they have to endure specific targeted um, conduct in a way that nobody else does, then you are really in the harassment area at that point in time. And so that's why these time, place, and manner restrictions in speech matter so much because they make it very clear that when you are protesting where you're permitted to protest in the hours in which you are permitted to protest, that you can, unless you engage in very individual targeted behavior, chant away, say what you want to say, But then when the encampments begin to go beyond to the point where students can't sleep or when they start to block Jewish students' ingress and egress through open spaces on campus, start to chase Jewish students, then you're getting into actual clear harassment territory. And the Department of Education has opened a number of investigations along those lines. There's been class action lawsuit filed against Columbia, for example, on this basis. There are lawsuits proliferating around the country. The ADL says that campus anti-Semitic incidents, including assaults, acts of vandalism, and other kinds of targeted harassment tripled on college campuses. So this is not just a bunch of college kids sort of harmlessly celebrating in boozy, drum circle, weed-soaked encampments. There's a lot more going on. Although that was a very nice phrase that it is in part. Okay, and like so much else in America, this is going to be worked out in the courts. But it strikes me that very little we've said in a half an hour, at least after the debacle that was the congressional hearing with the presidents of Harvard, MIT, and Penn, would you find official disagreement with? You know, there might be how you draw the line, it's, uh, et cetera. But even your sort of tripartite free expression, uh, civil disobedience and lawlessness. And yet you write, and I think uh, persuasively, that there's this profound confusion now mm-hmm. in, among the universe. And you do really have the feeling that smart, well-meaning people who love their uh, universities and love free speech are flummoxed. In some instances, it feels like the inmates is, are running the asylum. In some instances, you have a sort of, of kind of lurch from over passivity to strong enforcement. What accounts, you've drawn lines that are pretty hard to disagree with. So what, as a matter of practice and you know, concrete culture in the world, ha- creates this deep confusion you identify profound ideological bias okay so if you had had instead of a 
Students for Justice for Palestine encampment, if you had a MAGA encampment in the square in Columbia, and instead of um, drum circles and et cetera, you've got impromptu country music band going, people chanting MAGA slogans, and then maybe a few of them screaming and yelling at black students and female students um, in the periphery of the protest and blocking some of their access. The alacrity that with which these campuses would move would blow your mind. They would identify very quickly the problem. They would deal with it very quickly. They would see it for what it was and deal with it immediately. How do I know this? I spent 20 plus years, Harry, litigating the way that colleges respond to free speech that they don't like. And it's profoundly negatively. There have been speech codes, bias incident response teams, draconian speech zones. So you want to see how quickly the campus can move is when you have protesters who are opposed to the campus monoculture. But then what I've seen at campus after campus for year after year is when protesters are in sync with the ideology of administrators and faculty they are given an enormous amount of leeway, sometimes in cooperation with administrators and faculty. I've had cases where even while my own clients were being uh, prosecuted in campus courts for allegedly violating campus rules, outside the hearing room, the rights of my own clients were being violated by far left protesters with the administration not raising a peep. And some faculty seen- members kind of lionizing, actually. the uh- Yes. And then sometimes faculty members participating. And so that ideological bias means that if you're simpatico with the university, they're going to give you a lot of room. And then all of a sudden, they give them so much room that the situation spirals out of control, very predictably, by the way. And then they go, how did this happen? How did this encamp? We, dear encampment, we've worked with you in good faith. We've given you extra opportunities to protest that we don't give anybody else. And look, you're still breaking the windows of our administration building. What are you doing? And so that's what's happened is these campuses, many of them are just absolute ideological monocultures. There's this huge sympathy for the underlying cause of the protesters. And Harry, I hate to say it, you see us a lot in the sort of left of center media class more broadly. They have this sort of lionized view of the 1960s when the student protests many times were far more ugly and violent than people remember. Um, but it was their youth. It was their music. It was their and, culture. Yeah, right. But the most of the rest of the country doesn't remember those pro- protests so fondly. No, I mean the, some of the administrators, I think. Yeah. And that's bubble thinking. If you're going to sit here and look back at 1968 and say, those were the days, that's bubble thinking. Because to a lot of Americans, those were not the days. That lawlessness, that violence was a terrible time. And so the the idea that you've got people lionizing the 60s when a lot of the conduct should not have been lionized, admiring students doing what they think they should be doing reminiscent of the 1960s, but as they're doing it, they're sitting there violating the rights of other students that the administrators have equal responsibilities towards, even if they disagree with Israel, even if they have sympathy for the plight of Palestinians. Those Jewish students on campus are equal citizens, equal citizens to the protesters. And so this unbelievable ideological monoculture leads to a degree of sympathy for these protests. Often you see it reflected in media that you would not see if it was a different set of protesters. All right. So that is a really provocative um, view of the whole um, phenomenon. And, um, you know, but I think we're at the, the core of the argument. So, um, again, so much that this brings up. I'll start here. Says David French, colleges, people, there's an easy way out. It strikes me that that the um, problem that you've just identified, there is not an easy way out because it not seems that <laughs> very uh, um, connected to the entrenched. I mean, I think of Claudine Gay, in some ways, a martyr to uh, broader ideas who whose biggest misstep, uh, but it, she was dealt a very bad hand by Harvard at the it was was the impossibility of justifying the previous favoritism for certain causes. Yep. And, you know, what could she say? Well, that was my, those were my predecessors. So it's not simply a matter, though, is it of um 
whom, you know, presidents kind of uh, favor and what's in fashion at their cocktail parties, right? We have a very, the, this monoculture that you're talking about is, um, has a very strong, um, you know, part of the university apparatus. Yeah, there is. So, yes. so, um, so I'm pushing now on the notion that it would be easy. French becomes the Pope of university <laughs> colleges or, you know, is it like bring in, bring in Barry Weiss to strip DEI, you know, away? Is it that, um, uh, it, you know, is that really what's going on? And if so, you know, what do you, uh, what, how, what really can be, can be done to actually enforce in practice? I guess lawsuits is one, but I mean, you have genuinely benighted administrations, right? Who are just, you know, stepping in it right and left. And I think they have very strong constituencies within their institutions. I mean, if if tomorrow they you you became their advisors, it's not it's not or is it is it really you know Chicago you Vanderbilt comes up is it really just we're taking very seriously now these th these free speech principles, including as they apply to other students. What would what would step two, three, four, five, six be? Yeah. So we've actually uh, changed the problem, or maybe dare I say, a culture for the next time. The issue is what we have seen for decades in the universities, ever since they really became monocultures. That they have a they've been at war What's with a monoculture. By the way, what do you a mean? A monoculture is one that's sort of comprised of overwhelmingly of sort of one side of the political debate. Um, so. There's a if conventional a faculty, wisdom. Yeah. Right. If a faculty is 30 to one Democratic versus Republican, for example, that would be an example of a monoculture. Uh, a church is often a monoculture. Everyone who's in the church is part of a common ideological, I mean, theological strand. But anyway, so the problem that you have is within this, there are still divisions, even within what you might call more broadly a monoculture. And the divisions you've seen in the academy for decades, Harry, is the division between the illiberal left and the liberal left. So the liberal left wants to protect free speech and academic freedom. The illiberal left says free speech is a threat to social justice, et cetera. So the liberal left and the illiberal left have been at odds for a long time. And so what has happened is we've had various waves of illiberal action on campus that universities either have turned from voluntarily or they've been sued out of it. And so, for example, the speech code movement that began in the 1980s, 80s and 1990s culminated by the early 2000s in a situation where more than 70% of leading universities had one or more unconstitutional speech restrictive policies on the books. This was, so this was something that is born out of the university culture. And people like me were saying, these are unconstitutional. These are wrong. This supp suppresses free speech and academic freedom. And the answer from the university was sort of a collective shrug. What are you going to do about it? And the answer was, well, we're going to sue you at volume, at scale across the country. And not one university speech code was upheld on the merits. And after a while, the Is university. Is that right? Correct. Yes. I didn't know that. And wow. So, that's okay. And so after, after, um, Loss after loss after loss after loss, the universities and paying out lots of attorneys' fees and public relations disasters and universities began to shift course. And now only about a quarter of the top universities have speech codes and they don't really enforce them. But then you, the situation changes and moves. And now this permitting illiberal actions on campus, in other words, it's not from the top down where the administration is saying you can't speak, it's from the bottom up where camp students are saying, we're not going to let others speak, we're going to harass others, presents a very different challenge for the university. But the legal obligation of the, the underlying legal obligation still exists. And so I think if you're talking about internally to some of these campuses, you know, one of the things, if you're a lawyer for the, the university and you're in a room full of administrators who might have extreme sympathy for the point of view of the protesters, they might believe that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, et cetera. 
one of the things you have to say to them is, I understand that you have extreme sympathy. I understand that you see them fitting in the line of the 1960s protesters. I understand that you see the 1960s protests as a quite a good thing. I understand you have all of those starting presumptions, but none of those starting presumptions impact the law at all, not at all. And so the fact that you may think they're exactly right about genocide, the fact that you may, may be furious at Israel and the Netanyahu administration doesn't matter to the law at all. You still have to protect your Jewish students from harassment. You still have to treat all students equally in the eyes of your campus policies. And so that's what I would communicate. And I know, Harry, from personal experience that a lot of these folks will say, well, sue us. This is what we're doing. I literally have had administrators say that to me. We have a pretty big well, endowment. And and what what why are they saying that? Would you do do you think? Because um, they bo they believe so strongly personally in in the in in the culture that they that they carry the cards for. Is that that's your kind of view of this? There's a deep underlying ideological commitment. Um, and so I'll give you. And an here, just to keep just to push on a little. Basically, it's surely not anti-Semitic per se, but a kind of um, sense of bully versus underdog Israel in the misguided role of colonialist or whatever. But right. that that's how it fits in. And let me, can I follow up with this a little? Because, you sure. know, as a, as a Jew, I've, I've so resisted the notion that there's... Um, you know, that uh, there's anti-Semitism operating, though I've, a, a friend of mine who's now a college student at Harvard ba said to me, yeah, look, 98% are, are, you know, don't have any idea. And then there are 2% who are anti-Semitic shit. And I, so I want to ask who in the pre, it, it strikes me, you know, it happens to be Jews, although, you know, pe a lot of Jews could say it always happens to be Jews. So in uh, demonstrations of your, who have been the students whom other students uh, have not respected and have put in reasonable fear, fear of harassment and who were in that role? And how did universities respond then? Does my question make sense? Yeah. Well, um, the most obvious example is black students in the South in the 1960s. So, in there that were demonstrations by students. Oh, anti-civil rights demonstrations. Anti-civil. I mean, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you had comprehensive demonstrations against the idea of inclusion of black students in these universities. But interestingly, so you, you and this is one of the reasons for the nineteen the Civil Rights Act of nineteen sixty four, right? Protecting students on the basis of race, national origin, and color um, against discrimination in federally funded education, K through twelve, and higher ed is because of systematic anti-Black discrimination in, in these universities. Now, as you move on, a lot of the tactics at university uh, demonstrations have been similar, but the targets have not been. So you've had encampments around the um, protests against apartheid in South Africa, but there wasn't a local campus constituency to aim that at. Or or a lot of South African students or whatever, yeah. There's not like a big population of South African students to stand, you know, white South African students to say, you're targeting me. The protests against, say, the Iraq War, for example, again, not a local student population. One of the things that, but you saw many of the similar sort of tactics of occupying ground, et cetera. But what makes this so explosive is it starts to veer back towards that 1960s world in which you began to see you had students being targeted on the basis of shared ancestry. And so this is actually what makes this so much more difficult for the universities because you're seeing now a lot of progressive students and progressive faculty members being targeted on their own campuses in a way they've never been targeted before. They've always felt at home but because maybe of their support for Israel or their Jewish ancestry. And so it really is, in that sense, it's not that it's... By the way, there's a big difference between those two things. Support support for Israel, you scream at them how stupid they are. Jewish ancestry, you've got to... There's a problem if... if right, exactly. But and then the conflation of the two is a huge problem. And so you're in a situation where you're beginning to see targeting of students that's quite reminiscent 
of the targeting of students we saw actually in the civil rights era. And the fact that, again, I know the vast majority of student protesters are not doing this, but so many are doing it that it is a pervasive experience of Jewish students on many campuses to face this kind of intimidation. And from what you're saying, if one student's doing it, you've got to deal with that one student for sure. It doesn't have to be pervasive if somebody is just, you know, uh, wailing on a Jewish student, whatever. Um, right. And I want to get to that in a moment, how the discipline is working. Oh, we're running out of time already. I, <laughs> I, I do want to take a minute. You've mentioned it a few times. How do you see, and especially if you contrast it with previous um, outbreaks of uh, campus uh, protests, the role of the media uh, here over the last few months? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think the media overall has done a pretty good job of describing what's happening, which is its fundamental role. I think people have a pretty good idea of what's happening. Um, you do have, you know, from the sort of the hard news side, A happened, then B, then C, then D. This is, and with the, the omnipresence of cell phone video, it really has made it easier to sort of in real time see individual incidents rather than rely on written accounts. And so there's, I think overall, as far as here is what's happening, the media's done a pretty good job. I think when it comes to sort of commentary about it, too much of it is conducted as if the law doesn't exist, it, which is so weird to me. It's, it's conducted as if, oh, wow, we've never seen this before. What should people do? You're right. <laughs> when the reality is, we have so many decades of experience of college protests, and we have an entire legal infrastructure around it. And it's and and this helps us frame the question of what to do. We're not in some sort of state of nature where we're figuring this out on the fly, but very few members of the commentary class in the United States have much constitutional knowledge at all, much less drilling down to actual knowledge of doctrines of free speech and higher education. And so they're doing what we in the chattering classes do. We're weighing in on the news of the day. And too many of them just don't do the necessary research to know what is protected, what's not protected, what where does the law come in? Where does it not? You know, for example, there's this just fury. And by the way, is it a hundred percent clear there is a sense in which there are all these protected classes and Jewish Americans anyway, even though Israel is less than half uh, white, play as kind of the the sort of generic white male. But it but there there is no dispute about the their their being a, a protected class in the same way gays and lesbians or whatever uh, race, et cetera. Or is there any well, that's a big uh, that's an actually interesting issue because federal law does not protect against discrimination on the basis of religion in higher education. It does protect on the basis of race, color, and national origin in higher education. And both the Biden and the Trump administrations have put out guidance letters instructing that when the anti-Semitism is rooted not in religion, but in race, color, national origin, or what the Biden administration calls shared ancestry, then Title VI applies. And that's been the rule for many years. Which is the major law dealing with education. Right, exactly. Now, I think Congress should pass a law making it very clear that anti-Semitism is included in Title VI to resolve any ambiguity, but it has to be a carefully drawn law to avoid interfering with free speech rights. But the bottom line is that, um, you know, these... There's all of this angst. We can't bring police. We can't bring police. Well, wait a minute. You have legal obligations to other students under the law. In many circumstances, if you don't bring in police, you'll be violating the continuing to violate the legal obligations. And, and I also find it very weird, this kind of mindset that says these students are adult enough to be taken seriously in all their protesting and not adult enough to absorb the consequences of their law breaking. We don't do this for 20 year olds and 21 year olds off campus. I mean, the fact that you're a, a the fact that you're a Columbia student doesn't infantilize you. You're an adult. If you want to be taken seriously, you're going to have to also absorb serious consequences when the law requires it. And so that doesn't mean the police can crack heads, behave in a way that violates the civil rights of protesters. They should be disciplined. They should be restrained. But I'm just mystified by this idea that, oh, these poor kids. 
they, they're wanting, they're desperate to be taken seriously. They're trying to make adult arguments and in an adult fashion, and they're violating adult laws and violating the rights of their peers, and they're not in a police-free zone. I mean, this is absurd. Although, you know, this strikes me, trying to put myself in the shoes of university administrators, some of whom are friends, you know, and who, because it's easy to sort of demonize them as well, and they are in earnest about trying to to deal with the panoply of, of rights. I think there's a practical problem here, which is you have these kind of nice, you know, Gus and Jane campus security forces who are feckless in uh, in the face of this, and then you have the police and, you know, visions of Kent State, even though it was the National Guard and what really feels like an invasion of the cloistered educational institution. There's no sort of Goldilocks uh, uh, version here. So the, the, the administration, you know, pressing the bat signal there for, for municipal police is a uh, Culturally, well, practically, legally has very sort of big consequences. I but, mean, yes. You know, that, and that's just, you know, they, we need, that would be something we could. We sure, could. absolutely. And I don't have much sympathy. Okay. And, and here's why they let this situation spiral. Okay. Campus security. The administrators, when, yeah. The administrators. The campus security, when there's the first tent being pitched, is more than enough to say, nope. Nope, no tent. Once you have 50 tents pitched, and once you say, well, we're not actually enforcing our rules, we're going to let you do things that all of our rules say you can't do. And then after some set of period of time, we're going to go to these people who've already indicated that they have no regard for the rules and say, it's been enough. Will you fold up and go away? What on earth? Harry, are you serious? And so, again, it's this notion that I have sympathy for the underlying cause, so I'm going to give them more room than I give other students, and then they turn back and bite you, and everyone who is looking on the outside, who has an ounce of experience with this, is saying, this is a mistake, this is a mistake. And by the way, I'm among them, so I feel this, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm, I generally, you know, I, I generally have, you know, liberal values, but I'm a law enforcement guy, and this, this sort of position, they put themselves in again and That's again, amazing. saying, you have to leave, could you leave? Pretty please, could you leave? You know, it's so, um, you know, inimical to, to, that's the whole point of, of law enforcement. You know, the rubber hits the road. And when you yeah. let yourself get rolled then. All right, so let me, that's a whole problem of campus culture. And I can see they don't want a police state, but, I, but it is true to me. They've looked, you know, so um, impotent. What about now, though, you know, I think you have... Um, um, agreed with me that there's a it's e easy enough on paper but very very hard in practice in part because an enormous not just culture but administrative apparatus that mm -hmm. is you know bolsters the the uh, kind of of um, you know uh, more loved and less loved constituencies at school but what have they been messing up as best we can tell uh, there are people who maybe arrests have happened, but even in fairly notorious cases, you hear maybe about expulsions, but it's a little amorphous. Uh, you hear uh, there's an investigation underfoot, but you, there, there doesn't seem to be an, an end point to it. In previous instances, certainly the adults uh, who are demonstrating have had a chance to revert to child status. You know, and, and universities are very uh, not nervous legally, but also reluctant to kind of, of impose lawbreakers status on students for the rest of their lives. Has that been a fundamental mistake? Do, there, do they need to um, metaphorically bust heads as in have some high profile, expulsions, arrests, and the like, as opposed to just sort of clearing the, the landscape? Is, is that a, has that been a problem here? Well, outside of arrest for assault, which actually is a substantial crime that merits real prosecution, 
a lot of these are arrests for trespassing or they're misdemeanor arrests. They're, they don't really even matter to the students, to be honest. They get out, they're bailed out and they celebrate. And, you know, my parents wouldn't have liked it. I wouldn't have liked it. But anyway, a lot, a lot of the parents don't care, you know, uh, and and or maybe mad the kid got arrested. I mean, you know, this is the way we've seen all the whole gamut. But what really matters is actually the school discipline. And the school discipline is often behind the veil of in the federal FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. It's where so we we so can't we, know. You mean we can't know? And but it's the actual expulsions and suspensions that will matter much more to students than the trespass arrest. Um, but I do want to, Harry. We've talked a lot about the sort of crackdown element that where they let things go to a point where rights of others were being violated. In that circumstance, you have to do something. There's also the other opposite extreme, and where governors like Greg Abbott look at what's happening in Columbia. For, and that's if, who I had in mind, yeah. And then have said, none of that here, and then issued proclamations that violate the rights of the protesters. So so they say, we won't tolerate anti-Semitism on university campuses. And then they define anti-Semitism in such a way that they're going to suppress constitutionally protected speech. And so you've seen sort of one extreme in Columbia where the protesters were giving so much room that they ended up storming a building, vandalizing, breaking it, violence. And then you have the whole opposite extreme in a place like, say, a UT Austin, where essentially they just weren't letting for a, a, a one key period of time. It was as if they were cracking down on all protest at all. And so, you know, that's why this formulation robustly protect free speech, respect peaceful to civil disobedience and from the get-go yeah from the get-go and crack down on lawlessness prevent lawlessness you're going to head off a lot of these problems before they metastasize out of control you know it's a really you good know. point i hadn't thought of maybe this is a bit precious but in a way they are inadvertently disserving the demonstrators themselves yes. because they let things go to a point where door a is you know give them a pass but door b is a pretty serious discipline and if in, if instead the the real first amendment rules had been strictly policed from the start they wouldn't be in that position exactly right yeah all right let me just let's finish up with a few minutes on the political context here you know 1968 famously uh propelled or certainly uh contributed to the um, big um, revolt of the, a sort of silent majority was the was the kenning of uh, that you know Nixon supporters offered um, that um, you know uh, and and Humphrey and others were associated with anti-war protesters and that might have swept uh, Nixon in part to the White House and I think of that as a very bellwether. Um, uh, election more than I think people uh, give it, uh, you know, see it yeah. as, but up there with 1980 or 1932 uh, or whatever. What about now? Trump has come out strongly with Greg Abbott as a, you know, head cracking and uh, the, you know, these spoiled kids, a little bit reminiscent of Nixon. Uh, you know, you have the Speaker of the House coming to Columbia and, and basically giving lectures. And Biden has tried to be more um, I, I think it's fair to say modulated. How is this affecting, if at all? I mean, uh, sort of a, a feature, I think, of a lot of this stuff is a solipsism where you think the world revolves around you, et cetera. Maybe a lot of this washes over people. But how do you see it as affecting the national political landscape that is so crucial and where you've made your views you know, very apparent? Yeah, that's a great question. So how this is affecting November is unknowable. I mean, Harry, my gosh, we've got eight, nine different major news cycles to go through. Between but what's the New York Times for if they can't tell us this? <laughs> so how it's impacting November is unknowable. But how violent protests impacts people in the real in the real time moment is knowable and known. And so I don't know if you remember back in 2020, uh, data what you know one of the most prominent data guys on the left david shore 
uh, put out some information talking about how violent protests tend to undermine support for the underlying cause, dealing with a lot of data going back years and years. And this was the height of the George Floyd summer. And he got briefly canceled. I mean, people didn't want to hear that. He lost his job where he was working for providing truthful information that was cutting against a narrative that said this is sort of a urban street uprising that's going to really sort of change America. And he was saying, no, 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 These when things go from peaceful to violent or from peaceful to, to chaotic and disruptive, it really impacts people negatively. Um, that was pushed aside. It was pushed aside. And now a lot of smart observers say, you know, it was the sort of the defund the police in the summer of 2020 that really undermined the Democratic Party's expected showing in some of the 2020 elections. And a lot of smart folks say if Joe Biden wasn't taking on somebody as loathsome as Donald Trump, the outcome could have been it was very, very close as it was. And and so we have a lot of histor historical knowledge that says when these protests tip over into violence, it really begins to undermine support for the underlying cause. And and look, let's zoom back out, Harry. 68, Nixon wins. 72, Nixon wins. The Republicans won five of the next six presidential elections. Five of the next six. And a big part of this was the sense that the American left had become positively sometimes anti-American, that it was an instrument of chaos. People remembered the utterly chaotic scenes outside the Democratic National Convention in 1968. In Chicago, and where I'm, this year's convention will be held. Exactly. And if I'm a Republican and this chaos continues, they're, they're going to have the, the advantage will accrue to Republicans if this chaos continues. Now, does that mean that in, 20, in November, what happened in May matters? Very doubtful. But tw if the war in Gaza continues into the fall, if you have all of the tension around the presidential election and that chaos continues. Um, and, and one thing about a lot of this chaos, it's all happening in the media capitals of the world. It's happening in New York. It's happening in Los Angeles. And so it's impossible for people to miss. And again, this goes back to this lionization of the 1960s protesters. The war kept going for years after these protests started going for better part of a decade. And it's just a false narrative that says that students up rose, rose up in 1968 and ended the Vietnam War. It was events on the battlefield that dictated the course of the Vietnam War far more than the events on the quad. And, and, uh, and Nixon, at, even after all of these protests, I mean, bombs Cambodia, um, has you know covert campaigns in Laos. I mean, the war got bigger in some ways. And so there's this sort of lionization of that 1968 period, when I think when you look at it from a bigger view, it ushered in a lot of, I mean, Republican dominance in the White House for a generation and didn't actually, I think it's very debatable whether it ended much less shortened the war at all, because the war went on and on and on and on. And so the this sort of lionization, which I think is behind a lot of the sympathy is this lionization in the 1960s in many ways is a history that's shaded and I think perhaps distorted. And so is often the virtue of the protesters in the 1960s. Some of them weren't just against the Vietnam War, against American involvement. They were positively for the Viet Cong winning, right? And that's that was the wrong, that was the wrong side of the war. And and so the the idea that the 60s guys were all right and everything was that they were, you know, on the side of the angels, you know, we can, even if you oppose the Vietnam War, you can oppose the Vietnam War without being for the Viet Cong. And so I think that that's a, that if the more that Democrats buy into that narr that fake narrative of the 1960s, the more dangerous it's going to be for them in November. All right. Well, we've gotten super broad there and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I will uh, just note my my uh, abstention on some of the ways we've portrayed <laughs> it, but it, uh, what is a very, very rich question. Um, I'll say for the colleges now, you know, to their great, um, uh, you know, fortuity, May is coming or is here and they and they and college students want to go home. Uh, but yeah, will this will this continue? Because it, it I mean, it's a fact 
that, you know, things stay very intense until 72, 73, but the campus protest moments do have this epicenter and uh, white hot uh, sense in late 60s for sort of a number of reasons. Uh, as always, David, so illuminating and interesting to chew this stuff um, over over with you. I really appreciate it. If it does go on, I hope we can talk about other stuff. And if it abates, I always look forward to talking about the, uh, the all kinds of, of issues on the on the podcast and the like involving everything that's happening in this crazy year in the country. Thanks so much, Harry. This was a treat. And it really is difficult to separate sympathy from legal analysis when it comes to these kinds of things. And it's so necessary to separate sympathy and legal analysis. And uh, a great way to do that is to think, how would I react if somebody on the exact opposite side did exactly what these folks are doing? And it can help be clarifying. It's really true. And it's the soul of the law after all, yeah. you know, equal neutral principles. All right. Um, take care. Talk to you soon, I hope. Yes. Thank you, Harry. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.